Welcome back to another episode of the Broncos Avenue Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Amir Farrow, with my co-host, Jay Mack. And joining the show today is a former Denver Broncos quarterback who spent his rookie offseason in 2017 with the team, went 4-0 in the preseason while throwing for 413 yards, three touchdowns, no interceptions, and is currently a quarterback for the USFL's Birmingham Stallions. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Kyle Sloter. Kyle, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be on the show. It's uh, It's going to be a blast. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate y'all having me. Of course, man. Um, I want to go ahead and uh, start, you know, just basically um, we haven't had any quarterbacks on the show. You're the first quarterback to appear on the Broncos Avenue podcast. We've had multiple safeties, a corner, linebacker, D-line, O-line, wide receiver. What is it like to play quarterback at the highest level in the NFL? And can you kind of take our listeners through some of those uh, trials and tribulations of uh, playing that position? Yeah, you know, in my opinion, and I think uh, I share this sentiment with, uh, you know, most players in the NFL, but I think uh, the quarterback position is probably the hardest position in all of sports just because there's so much on your plate. Uh, it not only requires a lot physically, uh, but it requires a lot mentally uh, and probably even more so mentally um, just getting guys in the right place. So, for instance, on any given play, I'm going to get in my headset probably a 17 word play call that I have to have memorized. If my guys don't line up in the right spot, which <clears throat> probably half the time they're not going to, I have to say, hey, you know, buddy, get over here. You're lined up close off of the wing, off the tight end over here. And hey, you got to remind everybody pre-snap because everyone's thinking through their adjustments. Got to remind them of the snap count. So we have like little code words to remind everyone of snap count. If there's like a lull in everything, um, then you have to remember – your responsibilities uh, pre-snap have to know where the protection's going, have to identify pre-snap coverage and then post-snap coverage because in the NFL it changes. Then you got to remember where everybody's running in the routes. You got to remember to say the right cadence yourself. Um, and it's just a uh, it's a myriad of different things and uh, challenges and like you said, trials and tribulations. It's it's definitely tough to uh, even get to a place where you're looked at as an NFL quarterback coming out of college because you have to display and show some of those things, uh, those traits and qualities that uh, these NFL GMs and scouts like. So it's definitely a challenge for sure. Yeah, that I can I, I'm I'm dead on and agree with you about the quarterback being the hardest position. I know people like to throw pitcher in there, but I'm like, dog, the pressure of an NFL quarterback yeah. is is unlike any other in sports. But I do want to ask you real quick. I want to ask you about your time in the uh, USFL. Yeah. You're, you're still in it a little bit. You know, just kind of walk us through that atmosphere. You know, how much different is it than the NFL? And just just walk us through it. Yeah, you know, it's completely different. Um, you know, obviously from a fanfare standpoint, everybody kind of goes crazy for the NFL. And the USFL is something that's kind of uh, coming onto the scene. It's working its way up. It'll never be where the NFL is um, just because of the history and all that kind of stuff. But I think it's really good for football because it gives a lot of these guys like, you know, if they had some sort of deal worked out where a third string guy could go play some summer ball somewhere and still be on an NFL team, get some reps, because that's what's most valuable. You see a lot of guys at the end of the bench um, that stick around on teams that uh, don't ever get to get into any games and get any meaningful experience because practice is one thing. But once you know you're going to get hit by some of these 300 pound guys, it changes the uh, the dynamic of everything. You kind of find out who's got it. Um, you know, the the USFL uh, is definitely something that, you know, I, I've said this along with a bunch of other people uh, in that league, but if they could get the pay to anywhere close, not close, that close is ridiculous, but say the pay is $200,000 for like a minimum for like 10, 12 game season for a USFL. If we were to get to that point, I think you would actually see some people leave the NFL and go play that because the stress level in the USFL is like what I would equate high school to. Like there's like it's not even college, like in terms of the stress level. It's like you go, you practice and then you have to because they don't have like the facilities like college. You have a facility where you can work out, you can go to meetings, you can do all that kind of stuff. But really you're in a makeshift space to do like maybe one or two meetings for an hour and a half, two hours, as opposed to like six, seven hours in the NFL. So you get like two hours of meeting time and then you get two hours on the field. It's four hours a day and you're done. And there's not all the fanfare. There's not people like it feels like um, a very pure form of the game. 
And it makes it a lot of fun because, you know, there's a lot of guys in the NFL and I wouldn't put myself in this uh, category, but there's a lot of guys in the NFL that just the stress and the mental makeup it takes to play in the NFL, because every single day you go out to practice, you do one wrong thing, you might get cut. You show up to a meeting late, you might get cut. Like I still have nightmares of this used to be a, a common one when I was playing of waking up 30 minutes late to like in the meeting in the day has already started. And then you like jump up out of that dream and you're like, oh, thank God. Like it's only three o'clock in the morning. Like I still got time, but you know, so like stuff like that in the, the USFL doesn't exist, but I think you would see some of the guys that like struggle with like the mental health side of uh, being in the NFL is something that's very real that a lot of people don't speak about. And I think you would see some people leave and go play in the USFL for good money for way less stress. That's very interesting. Yeah, I, I like that. That's the biggest thing I was taking away from that, too, is like the mental side of things, like the the challenge of not only just playing the NFL, but playing the NFL at, at the quarterback position, let alone. Yeah. I mean, that, that's that got to be a, a lot on your shoulders, literally. It is. It really is. Um, so next thing I want to talk to you about is um, obviously uh, we're talking about on the topic of a quarterback. Russell Wilson um, last year, man, was a pretty, pretty rough season um, from all, all Broncos country for him himself. His, his worst career of the season. I don't think anybody can argue against that. Um, yeah. What are your what are your kind of your, your takes on Russell Wilson this season? His, his stats obviously look amazing. Um, but if you actually go and watch the tape, there's some games where he definitely could be uh, you know doing the little minor things a lot better, um, putting this team even in an even better position to, uh, you know, make better plays on offense. Um, what, what are your takes of, take on uh, Russell Wilson under Sean Payton this year, um, having yeah. a much better offensive line and just like better offense in general? Like what are your takes on Russell Wilson in 2023? Yeah, you know, I think Russell uh, made a big step, obviously, from last year to this year. Um, you know, who knows? The, the coaching thing has made a, a big deal between Hackett and uh, Sean Payton. Um, hard to tell. It looks like he's much more comfortable in, that's the only thing I can equate it to is he looks much more comfortable in a Sean Payton system as opposed to a Nathaniel Hackett system. Um, so, you know, I'm not in the building, so it's hard for me to say yeah. that the plays were the issue or, you know, whatever it was, won't speculate on that, but, um, no, he, he looks a lot more comfortable this year. Um, I will say uh, watching the Broncos and being a Broncos fan um, just because, you know, having played for the team, I consider myself I a lot of great memories there. Consider myself, you know, a Bronco and a Viking more so than any of the other teams that I played for. Um, you know, watching Russell Wilson, it's it's hard for me to not sit here and say that the defense couldn't be a lot better and put the team in a better position um, because when you have to score every single time to stay in games, like every single drive has to end in a field goal or a touchdown to stay in games. It feels like, and I haven't watched many games recently, but early on in the season, I was breaking down Russell Wilson film pretty regularly. Um, you know, obviously there's things that he can do better. Uh, I wasn't super impressed with the offensive line early on better than last year. Uh, but, you know, to me, it's kind of like you put a, guy that's kind of on the back end of his career behind a support system really from all sides of things. Like, I don't think anybody is overperforming. Like, I don't think the offensive line is doing great. I think they're fine. Like they're probably last year. I would put them near the bottom. They're yeah. better for sure. They're better for sure. Um, but they're still not in the top half, in my opinion. Um, they're okay in the run game. Pass game is a little bit suspect. And I think Sean Payton has done some things to, like if you watch each individual lineman, it's not much different from last year, but what they're doing in the scheme is a lot better. They're chipping more with tight ends. They're chipping more with running backs, which helps the tackles uh, get their blocks more easily. Um, the the receivers, I, I, I'm still waiting for Jerry Judy to kind of burst onto the scene like I thought he was going to from Alabama. Um, you know, that's that's a whole nother conversation in itself. Uh, I think Cortland Sutton uh, does as good as he can. Uh, I, I really like him as a player. And I think Javante Williams. So, like between Russell Wilson, Javante Williams, and Cortland Sutton, I think those are your three guys. And I, but you know, that's not enough. You need twenty-two guys to to step up and play with you on both the offense and the defense in order to have a good team. And they just don't. And, and obviously, your Pat Sertans. There's guys around. I really like that. Is it Alex Singleton? Is that the linebacker? Yeah. Yeah. 
I really think he plays hard. I like him a lot. He always stands out to me. Um, haven't really broken him down individually, but I just see him flashing on tape. Seems to be around the ball a lot. I mean, they have good pieces here and there. It just feels like an incomplete football team, and it's hard for me to judge Russell Wilson because – you know, it's it's going to be difficult for any good – like you put Jalen Hurts in that system, I don't think he succeeds either. So That's fair. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, so I'm really glad you brought up the defense because for the for most for majority of the season, the defense hasn't been playing well. But I will say over the last – maybe since the Bears game, they have been picking up a little bit with Van Joseph defense. You know, do yeah. you – and, of course, after beating the Chiefs, you know, do you think – like how do you think the Broncos season is going to go? Do you think that they could, you know – get back, you know, kind of stay on this track and maybe finish the season with a, a record above 500? Do you think they're going to just go back to, you know, how the Broncos usually are and just find keep finding ways to lose uh, ball games? Yeah, you know, it's, it's hard to say because, uh, you know, the one thing with the NFL and the difference from college football, college football, uh, more times than not, the better team is going to end up winning because there's more talent on that side. Like if you got Alabama versus Missouri, even in an Alabama down year, they just got more talent, so they're going to probably win more times than not. In the NFL, it's a crapshoot because everybody – there's no recruiting. It's all drafting players. It's all trading players. It's all – like that's one of the reasons why when you look at it from afar as a guy that's been in it, Nick Saban is a great recruiter, um, and I think that's his biggest uh, – from a coaching standpoint, like they want to put Bill Belichick and Nick Saban in the same like sentence, but I, not to say that I don't think Nick Saban's a great coach, but when he went to the Dolphins, like then you're handed a team where you have to draft guys. You, everybody's kind of on a more even playing field, and the worst team in the NFL can beat the best team in the NFL. So it's really who gets the confidence and the momentum at any point in the season. So like – I mean, everybody on the Broncos, that's the thing. Every We talk about, and I just said, how it, it feels like an incomplete team. Well, if if somebody finds like some mojo in the middle of the season, if you get like a, a the offensive line stepping up and playing great, which they can, because that's the thing. Everybody is the best player from their college team. Everybody's the best player in the world. That's why you're in the NFL. So you have the ability to do so. It's just executing upon it. And I don't think that Broncos right now are really executing. Now that can change overnight. They can come out and play well next week, and then they can stack that into week two, and then you're on a two-game win streak. And I've been in those buildings where, hey, we lost two games, but now we've won three, and it feels like we can't lose, and then we're going to win our fourth, and then we're going to win our fifth. When you're on a losing streak, it feels like you can't win, and when you're on a winning streak, it feels like you can't lose. So it's really just in the NFL, it's a confidence thing. It's going out there knowing that you know your assignments. So saying that, you know, they're going to finish above 500 or below 500, you know, right now I would probably lean towards below, but that's not to say that they couldn't end up. I mean, we got 10 games left. And if that, it, it just depends on the mental makeup of that locker room. If that locker room comes out and decides that, hey, we're tired of all the shit and we're going to double down on our efforts. We got guys staying late. We got guys working extra hard. We got guys. Or is everybody cutting out early? Is everybody thinking about next year? Because I've been in buildings where, you know, the season seems lost. And so the players are lost. So everybody just goes home early. And then you've got guys, and I've been a part of teams that are losing, that they don't accept losing for an answer. And they stay late. And they work hard. And they they have player-run meetings. And they do extra. And they want to win. And they don't, you know, there's, there's a difference in a team that, you know, some guys just want to want to be there for the check and some teams want to be there or some guys want to be there to win. And do you have more of the guys that want to win or do you want more guys that are just there for the check and want to go home and play video games? So <laughs> it, uh, I mean, it, it just depends. Like we'll see what happens, but I'm leaning towards under, but if you told me they ended up playing well, any NFL team can turn it around. It's just a matter of mental makeup. I like it. That's a, that's a great perspective. And I want to rely rewind a little bit back to uh, your time with the Broncos. I know you've mentioned um, who, who would you say are like some of the closest people you were with during your time in Denver, um, whether that was like players, coaches. I, mean, I know you mentioned before that Demarius Thomas kind of took you under his wing a little bit uh, when you signed with the Broncos as a rookie. Um, who are, who are the, some of the closest relationships that you formed uh, with uh, here in Denver? Yeah. Um, I would say Demarius Thomas uh, was one of my best friends. Um I was with him, you know, just a week before all that stuff went down. He was struggling with seizures and, um, you know, brain-related stuff. Uh, 
not going to talk on it too much, but miss him a lot. Um, Paxton Lynch is a great friend. Uh, he had a small wedding that I was a part of. Um, so I really like him. He's got a, a great vibe to him. Um, I know that, uh, you know, a little bit of a sour taste with Broncos fans and all that kind of stuff, but the guy was immensely talented. Um, sometimes guys just don't fall into the right situation. And then you talk about confidence. Um, you know, just to give a little example of it, like for me, my the the trajectory of my career changed when we had that preseason game and I against the Bears, my very first one, and threw a, a touchdown in you know in a comeback victory against the Bears in preseason, and everybody's hyping you up, and you get confidence. It changes. I mean, I I went on to play really well in every preseason game I ever played in. I think because of that moment, when you have your I'm here and I belong moment. I think that's powerful. And and I just don't know that Paxton ever got to experience that. I think everybody being a first round pick, a lot of pressure. And it kind of just, you know, when you experience failure before success, sometimes it can make you spiral. So, um, and then everybody was pretty tough on him, but great guy. Um, Von Miller, when I was there, I was close with him, uh, hung out with him a lot. We were uh, locker mates, uh, like right next to each other. So, Really good friend of mine. Um, don't get the opportunity to speak to him too, too much. When you have guys like that, that their stardom is so like uh, <laughs> just out of this world. It's crazy. You don't lose any love for the guys. Uh, it's just they don't pick up the phone. They don't answer text because they have literally they put their phone down. And then like, you know, for t- at times I experienced this in a microcosm, like very much smaller amount. But like I'll set my phone down for an hour and have you know, 20 calls and 20 texts, that guy puts his phone down for 20 minutes and he has 500 calls and 500 texts. So it's just like, you can't get through to him. So yeah, like it doesn't sound like very much fun, honestly. Um, Emmanuel Sanders, great guy, a uh, ton of respect for the way Aqib Tlaib treated me as a rookie. Um, love that guy. Uh, Jake, Butt, all my rookies I came in with, um, you know, I was roommates with Isaiah McKenzie, a lot of respect for him. I mean, the thing is, uh, and I think what was so refreshing for me as a guy coming into the NFL, you think coming in like there's going to be some egos and some attitudes and some people that are bigger than life and people that are going to be like, rookie, like what, what the hell are you doing here? Blah, 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 like treat you like shit kind of thing. And um, I think what was so refreshing for me was every single person I met um, really across the league, I have never – I have yet to be around somebody that I dislike. And I think it's really cool because the NFL is a fraternity and it's, it's an exclusive fraternity. It's something like the NBA. You hear people talk about like, Hey, we don't want to hurt anybody. We're not out here to hurt anybody. Everybody's got families to feed. We want you guys to do well. Like when people got big contracts, we always cheered for them. Like we're all dude. Great. Because it's really the players versus the league. And that's how everybody looks at it. It's not like, you know, in in a sense on Sundays, it's the Broncos versus the Vikings or it's the Broncos versus, but like when you're like just walking around in the off season, like those are your brothers. Like everybody that plays in the NFL is just a, a member of that fraternity. And it's really like, Hey, go get yours. I'm going to get mine type of thing. And you know, I, it's your instant friends with so many people. So it's hard for me to name all the guys that I'm really good friends with because like I try to keep in touch with everybody. And uh, I mean, I've got hundreds of friends from all over. So everybody's been so good to me. Yeah, no, that's a, that's crazy. I mean, just all of the guys you named are some of, are some of my favorite players, just still even in some of them still in the league, just playing at a really high level. I mean, it, and it's crazy to hear that you, you know, like a team like that, you may think you come in and guys give you a hard time, but yeah. you know, yeah. Derek every, Wolf, really cool guy. Like everybody was just super, super cool. Every player that we've had on the show, every single one tells us that like nobody looks at the depth chart and is like, man, I gotta beat this guy out. Or or like no. maybe you're obviously you want to be a starter, but like yeah. you're not, you know, like you know, Josie Jewel in the locker room, like, yeah, I need to I need to make sure this Drew Sanders kid doesn't beat me. Like they don't look at it like that. So I like yeah. how uh, every single Broncos player that's talked to us, that's that's kind of the mindset. It's it's a brotherhood, and I, I you know that's it's cool to hear. Yeah. For sure. I would say in that dynamic as well, just to add to the perspective, um, difference from college to, to pro, the money kind of makes it 
uh so there's no questions because like when i go into say like in college like i'm trying to beat out so and so so i can get i got four other guys i got to beat out to try to be the quarterback in the nfl i'm behind kirk cousins who's making 84 million dollars guaranteed so like i'm not going to play above him so like there's not there's no sense in making you know you know what i mean you're not gonna yeah. win so don't make enemies type of thing so and that's the same probably with you know, Josie being behind some guys to start his career, like, you know, they were getting paid. He wasn't. So it wasn't like I got to beat him out because you're not going to. And then, you know, now he's being paid and the guys coming in behind him. It's like you're not going to beat me out because I they, they've invested in me. And that's what a lot of people don't understand from the outside looking in. It's not a best player plays type thing. It's most money plays. Yeah. In most instances. Yeah, and um, real quick, so Amir brought it back to around your time in Denver. And obviously, you know, you um, the head coach was Vance Joseph. It was his first year as a head coach, and he is back with the Broncos right now as the defensive coordinator. You know, can you kind of go into, you know, how Vance was? You know, what was your time like with Vance and just what type of person he is? Yeah, coach. you know, I yeah, yeah. I, uh, I have a huge amount of respect for Vance. Um you know, I, I know defense is uh, – and that's not all on him. Like, there's – players have to take accountability as well, and I know they are um, internally. I know that there's – there's. I mean, he's been such a good guy in the time that I've been around him. Um, he's one of the reasons that I was picked up in Arizona, um, vouched for me when he was the defensive coordinator there. Um, you know, he – his leadership is really what allowed me to have the opportunity to um, end up having a six year career in the NFL. Um, you know, I went to a bunch of other camps and whatnot throughout my career with different teams. And, you know, as a undrafted free agent rookie, I was getting equal reps with Trevor Simeon and Paxton Lynch. We would, they would get six, Paxton would get six, I would get six. And I had, ample opportunity to show exactly what I could do. It gave me a ton of time in preseason, allowed me to be myself, allowed me to make the plays the way that I make plays and see things the way that I see them. He was somebody that, you know, a lot of times, like, you know, if I'm the last one in the building eating dinner late by myself, uh, Vance Joseph would walk through and, you know, I would say nine out of 10 coaches are going to go sit across the room by themselves. Vance Joseph pulled up a chair right next to me and sat with me many times, um, asked me how I was adjusting, asking me, uh, you know, how's life, talking about things outside of football. Uh, we talked about we both go to the Virgin Islands a lot. Um, so, you know, he cared about you as a person, and uh, I really respected that about him. Um, really great guy. Uh, you know, I think fans and stuff can – I, I see and hear things of like calling for a guy's job and, you know, whatnot, you know, it it's, I know it's football and people get, you know, emotional about it, but thinking about the person that he is and how many lives he's changed and touched and been such a good person. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful to him for uh, the opportunity that he gave me. And even though it didn't work out uh, right away in Denver for me after cuts, uh, I know he wanted to keep me. It wasn't his decision. Um, and even if it was, that, that's just the way it goes sometimes. It's not a it's it's just business. It's not personal. And I never took anything personal. Great guy, uh, great leader, great man. Um, and I think he has a, a phenomenal defensive scheme. Uh, it's just for whatever reason right now in Denver, there's some pieces missing, uh, whether that's from you know, play call here and there or players, I don't know. Uh, but you know, he has the ability and he has the knowledge and he's just such a great person. I know those guys are going to rally behind him. Yeah. And the, like the thing is like the last three weeks of defense, a lot of people don't even know is average only 15 points per game. I mean, the turnaround that he's actually had yeah. is like probably the biggest in NFL history for being honest. Like yeah. you went from yeah. allowing 70 to a Miami Dolphins team, like 35 yeah. to a commander's team. And yeah. then now you're, you're allowing nine to a Patrick Mahomes, Andy Reid offense. Like the turnaround yeah. is actually like, ridiculous and i think he, he deserves a lot more love and credit for that for sure and that's why you know earlier i said like early on in the season i need to break down i don't ever want to speak on things that like i haven't seen games recently in the last two or so 
I saw yeah. the early games. Um, but if that's the case, then I'm happy for him. I, I hope it continues for the Broncos for sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I was just going to really say, like, I mean, you talk about turnarounds. You couldn't have told me that this, that this defense was going to find a way to turn around, turn it around yeah. as quickly as they've done it. And I, I know some guys came back from injury and everything, but like, I mean, you talk about uh, 70 to the Dolphins, giving up 28 to the Bears, and then just to come back and, like, complete – I mean, it, Patrick Mahomes in the first game we played him, he didn't really do – he didn't really have a spectacular game, which is usually the case. And then you just talk about the game against Green Bay, how well the defense played. And then the last game is Kansas City. I mean, it's really ridiculous just to see the complete turnaround, like the substitutions that were made, the lineup changes, playing, elevating guys. I mean, it's – it's. I feel like it yeah. should be talked about more in the league right now in terms of just like – I mean, this guy was on the chopping block. I mean, he really sure. was. I mean, Bronco fans were calling for his job. I was really a, a critic of just like the defense in general. I mean, your team gives us 70. You're like, yeah. come on, man. Like. Stuff, and yeah. I, I, yeah, I'll give them all the credit for just, I mean, it's really spectacular. For sure. Yeah. Um, so I want to go ahead and uh, ask you one of my uh, last questions. Um, my good friend, uh, Johannes Shea, um, I know he's made some uh, edits for you on your page. He's actually, uh, I consider him one of my uh, best friends. So he really? wanted me to slip this uh, question in there. Um, but he's a you know, big fan of yours. He's uh, obviously, like I said, made some uh, edits for uh, your, your USFL and everything. Um, he wanted to ask you, um, if you at like absolutely had to pick, like what is your favorite? What is one of your favorite moments with the Broncos, whether it's on the field or off the field? And then like if you could just like kind of like explain to us like what the facility is like, um, and like yeah. how do you feel about the city of Denver and the state of Colorado in general? Yeah, Johannes is. Uh, I've I've you know never met him in person. Uh, I don't believe uh, a lot of faces and things get, but I've I'm grateful. He he's kind of captured, and this is. Uh, I'm I'm grateful to him for capturing my the early part of my career made the highlights because I don't have anything other than what he's made so super grateful for him um, and and how he's been able to help me capture uh, the early part of my career and um, you know it, it's it's awesome what he's done for me uh, again grateful to him but I would say the most memorable part of my Broncos career would be would probably be that first touchdown I threw in Chicago because that's kind of like your it, saying you've arrived in a moment like that would be silly. Um, but like I said, it's your I can do this and I belong moment. Um, and that kind of propelled me to uh, be able to have the career that I did and have the confidence and the belief in myself. Because, you know, if you think back, I was a wide receiver in college a year before yeah. that. Um, so, you know, you go from being a receiver to thrust in because of an injury, at quarterback, and then now you're in the NFL. It's like, you know, everybody's been playing quarterback for you know a huge part of their career. And now I'm just getting into this position and, uh, can I really do it? So I would say having that, uh, was huge for me. Um, you know, I would say between hanging out with the guys, um, uh, hanging out with guys like uh, Von Miller and Shane Ray and Domita Pecco and uh, Demarius Thomas and Emmanuel Sanders and going on the road with those guys and, you know, hanging out in their rooms and watching movies and just chilling and playing pool and, um, you know, a bunch of different things, going to dinners together, uh, both on the road and uh, in Denver. Uh, the rookies took a trip to – Let's see. We went to Colorado Springs um, and then we went to the Olympic training ground for three, four days. And the the Olympic training ground, the dorms that they have you in are like worse than college dorms. It's like cinder blocks. So it's funny when you're put in a situation like that with like some of your best friends, you just like it's not a great situation, but because you're just with the guys laughing about it, like we had to walk like a hundred yards outside to go to like, if you had to take a piss in the middle of the night, you had to wake up out of your dorm, put on shoes, go outside, walk across the way, go to the bathroom. I mean, it was just, it was kind of weird that that was the Olympic training ground facility. Like I thought they'd have something a little bit different than that, but it wasn't. Um, and then we went to this, uh, they had like a glass bridge something or something out there. But we 
lot of guys that wouldn't walk across this like big canyon type thing uh just scared uh <laughs> laughing at them because they're like on their hands and knees like crawling across for like 300 yards grown men um yeah i mean <laughs> hilarious like you got big 330 pound guys like on their hands and knees crawling across the damn bridge because they're scared they're gonna fall through so i mean just funny things like that like i've got a million videos of uh you know carlos henderson probably had a controversial time in denver but me and him the way that everybody remembers uh, i still get texts from some of the older guys but they would try to rile me and carlos up because we were the biggest uh smack talkers on the team so and we we would say things like i'd tell carlos he was built like a traffic cone in the team meeting and everybody would you know die laughing he'd say i had buses on my feet uh for shoes because i wear size 15 and you know it, it just things like that like guys just send me random videos of those kinds of things and I always puts a smile on my face um but yeah the the facilities uh top notch um the chef there alfredo legendary we still talk about him um he uh you know you want a bison burger you want some lasagna you want whatever you you get you like they don't have it made already like he'll sit there and make it for you so he was uh phenomenal they had a great nutrition station um locker room was awesome uh training staff was awesome training room was great uh indoor facility was awesome I mean, I, I love Denver. I mean, there was – I'd go back there in a heartbeat. Like, it wasn't because I didn't want to be there. Like, they just didn't want me at the time. So, yeah. I, I mean, I – at the end of preseason, I saw myself as, like, a career Bronco, like, playing for the Broncos. So, one of my last questions I have for you, I'm going to stay, like, in the Denver area real quick. So, yep. you know, you obviously went to college in um, North Colorado, I think it was. Yep, yeah. Northern Colorado. Yep. Yeah, North, so, did you think there was any chance that you were going to be a Bronco or was it like, like, how did that whole process go? And was it, was it really a shock for you to actually like stay in Colorado to actually play for the Bronco? Yeah. So, I was truthfully, I was kind of pissed off and I'll tell you why. So, I went to school in Northern Colorado, about an hour north of where Denver was. And uh, obviously, was there for two years. Well, I asked my professor because it became more and more likely that, you know, I wasn't going to be drafted early on in January. Uh, and then, like, as we approached the draft, I kept hearing teams say, we're taking you in the fifth round, we'll take you in the sixth round, you know, all the way to the seventh. And so I'm like, okay, I'm, I might get drafted. So, like, uh, and I felt like, everyone we talked to is like, you're going to be an undrafted free agent at least. So you're going to be somewhere, but with all those reports and things starting to come out and my name starting to appear in things, I'm thinking maybe I could get drafted. So I wanted to share that experience and have uh, that with my family back in Atlanta, where I'm from, where I'm living right now. Um, and uh, yeah, so I asked my professor because the draft happens and then you have like two more weeks of college or whatever to like finish your finals and all that kind of stuff. So I asked my professor if I could do my final two, two and a half weeks early so I could move out of my house at Northern Colorado and go back to Atlanta. Well, you know, two weeks later, I just moved all of my shit to, <laughs> to Atlanta, 24 hours, drove it, drove the, I mean, my dad wow. flew out, we did it together um had to pack up all my stuff moved all my stuff and then i'm going right back to denver i'm like <laughs> i mean i could have just left all my stuff there and moved it an hour or whatever it was to denver i mean in the end i would have had to move it regardless but like i could have delayed the process for like another five months or whatever but i was just like damn like i just moved all my stuff like i just told literally made an instagram post of like me playing football with northern colorado of like you know uh mountains have been good to me but let's get back to the peach state type of thing and <laughs> blah 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 and i'm like damn i'm right back here like what's going on so i uh and i i will say initially was a little bit mad at the broncos because they called me and told me that so like you find out you're going to be drafted i would say probably 15 picks or so before the actual pick happens so everybody knows um 
I would say that's more common for like day three. I would yeah. say it's probably two or three picks on like day two, day one type of thing. Day three, it's going so fast that, you know, they call you probably 15 ish picks. Um, but so they call me halfway through the seventh round and they're like, Hey, we're going to pick you with our last pick. You're, you're going to be Mr. Irrelevant. I'm like, all right, sweet. So, and I had already been called by the Washington Redskins twice in the fifth round at the top of the fifth round. And at the end of the fifth round, by the Washington Redskins. So I had been celebrating with my family, waiting for in the Washington Redskins select somebody else. And we're just wow. like, what the hell is going on? And then they call back. They're like, hey, sorry, we had something like happen. We had to get this guy. Uh, we're going to get you at the bottom. I'm like, all right, it's cool. I just lost a hundred thousand dollars because I slipped. So, and then they call, they call me, say, hey, we're taking you, blah, blah, blah. Pick comes. Washington Redskins select somebody else. I'm just like, what the hell is going on here? So then I go to the set. Yeah. And so I'm pissed off because like, you know, I got like $1,500 in my bank account and just watched like, you know, signing bonus for fifth round. Even at that point, it's like 400,000. So I'm like, well, shit. Like, you know, I thought I was going to, you know, you just ripped 400 grand from me. So I'm just like, damn. And then, uh, go to the seventh round and, uh, the Broncos call me and I think like the last picks like 90 grand or whatever and like a trip to Hawaii or something. I'm like, okay, that's, I mean, that's something. So <laughs> yeah. like, you know, something to start my life. I'm going in the NFL with 1500 bucks and uh, get picked up or the Broncos call pick comes Chad Kelly. I'm just like, Oh man, I was told <laughs> three times I'm going to be drafted and we go and get another quarterback. And then like, the the after uh, the after I'll never forget this this feeling. So then the Broncos and the Redskins call and they say, "Hey, we still want you to be like a part of our team." Blah blah blah. The Redskins were offering me twenty grand to be the fourth guy as an undrafted free agent, and the Broncos were offering me twenty five hundred. So, but I was going to be the third guy because Chad Kelly was hurt. So I was mm -hmm. like, well. I'm going to bet on myself, go to the Broncos, be the third guy as opposed to the fourth guy, which when you got 1500 bucks, 20 grand sounds great. So um, went and took the 2500 go to the Broncos. Um, and I hear John Elway when they're describing the class that they had just drafted. They're like, we love Chad Kelly. We actually had like a first, second round grade on him. Couldn't believe we got him, blah, blah, blah. Um, and they're really? like, yeah, and they're like, well, he, the, and then one reporter's like, well, he's not going to be able to play because he has that tendon torn in his wrist. And he's like, yeah, it's going to take about three, four months. We brought in a camp arm uh, just to, you know, fill in until he's healthy. And so, like, they, they named every single player, even the free agents by name, and called me camp arm. And I was just like, I'm going to go out here and go crazy. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. And then <laughs> the funny, the last funny story, so – we had to stand up in order of uh, signing bonus. So like first round pick Garrett Bowles, uh, you have to say name, college, position, and then signing bonus. And Garrett Bowles goes like, you know, in his Garrett Bowles voice goes, uh, Garrett Bowles, offensive line, Utah, uh, $11 million. And everybody's like, <laughs> ooh. And, uh, you know, all the way down the line, you know, like, you know, 1.5 brendan langley and blah, blah blah and then undrafted whatever stand up so like i got in good right away um with everybody because i stood up i'm i go kyle slaughter northern colorado uh quarterback signing bonus 2.5 thousand and uh everybody lost their mind they thought that was hilarious so and then i made this video of uh um uh, What's his name? Uh, McCoy. I'm trying to think of his first name, but he was the offensive coordinator for Mike us. McCoy. Mike McCoy. Made a video of Mike McCoy, uh, like a parody video that, like, for my rookie <laughs> skit, and everybody <laughs> lost their mind at that. So I got in. That's the way you got to get in with those guys. If you want them to like you, you just got to be funny. Yeah, ma imagine you, uh, you, you stand up and say "camp arm." That would, that would have been a, uh, that would have been something. Arm, yeah, camp arm, two point five thousand. I can't believe the disrespect, man. That that honestly kind of pissed me off. Yeah, yeah, I'm not gonna lie, Washington. That I, I've never heard that teams actually like will call you and say they're drafting you and then just straight up like yeah. don't pick. Well, I multiple times. About, yeah, but like 
just like multiple times, okay, we're gonna draft you here, we're gonna draft you here, and then just never draft you. I think that's just that is yeah. Wow, that's crazy. You know, the the disrespect, um it's it's been real the whole time. It's still real. I mean, I gotta wake up every day. It's it's just I mean, it's part of my life, but wake up every day to somebody on Instagram, somebody on Twitter telling me I suck. Uh luckily I have enough people also saying that I'm good. Uh and they you know, a lot of enough fans that that care and all that kind of stuff. And no, none of it bothers me, but it's uh you know, I, I figure you're doing something right if you got people that are willing to hate on you. And uh it's just something that fuels my fire. If I was somebody that it, it got to me, I wouldn't be where I am. It kind of it's something that I mean, I've got Twitter posts on my mirror. Like I've got things that nobody's have said to me that just like irked me that like when I wake up to brush my teeth is the first thing I look at and it gets me going and it, it, it propels me to do something great. So I'm somebody that loves that kind of stuff because it just, it drives me. I love the hate more than I love the love. That's awesome, man. Yeah. I, that's amazing. Big stuff. Um, so yep, that's going to be all of our questions for today. Um, I know, uh, J Mac want to talk about this a little bit. Um, you, you want to tell the people a little bit about uh, your YouTube channel that you started with the film reviews and everything. Um, I watched the Will Levis uh, video, the breakdown yesterday. That was top notch, man. I loved it. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm just starting a YouTube, uh, channel. Uh, it's really geared and centered towards, uh, people that want to learn more about the game. You know, football is such a big, uh, sport in our culture and our society, um, and it's something where, you know, I would say myself coming out of college, like I put myself on a three out of 10 of football knowledge and then learned everything that I know from being in the NFL. And it's weird, but you truly, you truly don't know football until you get to be around some of those minds in, in pro football. So I'm trying to take the knowledge that I've accrued to put it into a YouTube channel um, so people can start to talk the language, understand what they're seeing. Um, you know, talking about like somebody called me the other day and was like, man, I had no idea what 21 or 12 personnel was. Um, <laughs> and that that's considered like base personnel. And then the defense matches that. That's why they're in base defense themselves or nickel defense or dime to match like all the receivers on the field. They're like, I had no idea about those things. So it's something where I'm trying to build an audience of people that really just want to understand what they're looking at on Saturdays and Sundays and really just football in general. So, um, yeah, y'all, whoever's listening out there, y'all give me a follow or subscribe on uh, my new YouTube channel. I'm trying to uh, build it organically and going to be doing some giveaways and things later on once I get it uh, to a place to help people around the holidays. So, um y'all give it a follow yeah make sure you guys follow him uh over there on x at kyle Slaughter. make sure you guys subscribe to his uh, youtube channel um you can uh, look up at, at kyle Slaughter one or you can just click the link in the description it doesn't matter if you listen on youtube spotify apple Podcasts. we'll have the link in the description i uh, make sure you guys go show show love to the guy kyle Slaughter. um but with that being said that's going to be it for today's episode make sure you guys like and subscribe to the channel as well um you know like i said please subscribe help us get our 2000 subscriber goal um trying to hit that uh pretty here pretty soon um make sure you guys are turning notifications on as well if you're listening over a spotify podcast leave a five-star rating hit the follow button turn notifications on so you never miss an episode of the broncos avenue podcast uh but kyle thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be on the show um i know we're all busy these days holidays or we just passed halloween and then we got thanksgiving and christmas coming so absolutely yeah appreciate you guys for having me y'all are awesome yeah appreciate, appreciate it. it that's gonna be for today's episode i hope you guys enjoyed i'm your host amir farrell with my co-host j mac and today's guest kyle Slaughter. so next one peace out everybody peace yes, sir